ability to show 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. for some culture and also for thinking about how we might enjoy some of those amazing productions with social distancing. Uh, my name is Toby Fox, I'm the Managing Director at 3Fox, the marketing agency for councils since 2004. Uh, as part of our work bringing councils and the development community together, we're running a weekly webinar in this slot every Tuesday for a month, looking at the ways in which culture and placemaking are entwined and how changes to each have affected the other during the past couple of months and what's coming out of these awful circumstances of the COVID-19 emergency that may be worth retaining. That's in addition to our regular Thursday 11 a.m. sessions where this week we're going to be working with Montague Evans to answer the timely question, how can councils help make development healthy? And very much hope you can join us again for that this Thursday. But back to today, where our topic is, how are the ways we design and shape places being altered by changes to the way we consume culture? during and after the pandemic. In this, the first of our month of culture sessions, we're working with two of the most thoughtful businesses in the development industry, the developer you and I, and the consultant Inner Circle, to ask whether the way we consume the arts could permanently alter building design. We should be exploring how cultural institutions are responding to social distancing and what new uses performers are making of space, uh, what ways to consume culture that are new are likely to endure, do these changes affect the ways the development and other business communities collaborate with the arts and the reasons for doing so? How and why have councils and arts institutions worked together during the pandemic? How will that cooperation evolve? And how does that affect the way we design places? What role do arts institutions have in sustaining and reviving town centres and high streets? Well, why does all this matter? On one level, the government says the cultural sector contributed 32.3 billion to the UK economy in 2018, and that was up 2.7% from the previous year. The subsector, film, TV and music, made up three-fifths of that, or 21.3 billion. It's big business. But on another level, it really matters to us as people. And here's a quote. Art influences society by changing opinions, instilling values and translating experiences across space and time. Research has shown that art affects the fundamental sense of self. Painting, sculpture, music, literature and the other arts are often considered to be the repository of a society's collective memory. Has that sentence ever been more relevant in light of the recent furore regarding statues? To discuss these weighty matters, uh, perhaps leavening them with insight and maybe even wit, if that's possible at this time of day, we're very fortunate to be sharing the next 55 minutes with a very distinguished panel. And it's a great pleasure to welcome this morning in alphabetical order, uh, Nick Durston, the Chief Executive of the South Bank Employers Group. Good morning, Nick. Councillor Jack Hopkins, leader of Lambeth Council. Good morning, Jack. Uh, John Langley, the Head of External Relations at the National Theatre. Good morning, John. And Despina Tsatsas, Executive Director of the Young Vic. Good morning, Despina. Our programme this morning is to run through, uh, for the next half hour, um, some presentations from each of our panel. And they're going to set the scene for us, uh, spending about five minutes each. 
And then we're going to spend half an hour around about 9 a.m. Uh, in a conversation. And I hope that you viewers will be able to join us in that via the Q&A and the chat functions in Zoom. You should find those buttons at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll also be running some snap polls during the session, uh, which will help inform our report uh, from this session afterwards. Around about 9.30, as close to that as I can make it, uh, we will close with a short clip kindly provided by the Young Vic Theatre to give us a taste of what we missed during May and to provide you with perhaps a couple of minutes of breathing space before you launch into your next Zoom meeting. Uh, but that's all ahead of us. Right now, I'm going to turn to Councillor Jack Hopkins and ask uh, Councillor Hopkins, how has the council supported cultural and arts groups uh, since lockdown to allow them to keep delivering to audiences during the pandemic? Um, thanks, Toby. Um, uh, my good council officers provided me some slides, but I think actually, given I've got five minutes, uh, oh, there we go. Um, I'm going to really whiz through these because I think the, the Q&A and the, the conversation is more important. I mean, um, Lambeth, we're very lucky in that right up and down the borough from kind of Waterloo and the South Bank, obviously, through Brixton, Stockwell, uh, to Streatham and uh, Norwood. Uh, we've got great big arts organisations, we've got great cultural organisations, we've got small groups, we've got loads of different kind of feeders and I suppose it's that point that culture happens in lots of different ways and lots of different levels and uh, it's not all about a trip to the theatre, it's about how do you express yourself and I suppose culture for me, uh, raising a 10 year old is uh, all sorts of things, does, does it move you? Uh, you know, so I, I put football in that category because it moves me and it makes me think and feel and, and those are important. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, thanks Toby. Um, I mean, we, we know the big challenges, so I'm not going to go through those. and I'm sure John and Nick are going to talk about that. But um, obviously there's a huge economic impact and then there's a huge kind of social impact that we're not quite seeing yet, um, but we'll, that we're feeling. And as we're talking to people who previously either worked in that industry or benefit from it, um, uh, we're, we're, we're going to have to kind of explore what does this mean for people. And there's a kind of major mental well-being challenge, I think, for every resident, um, regardless of what their experience has co of COVID and this challenge has been. Uh, if we go to the next one, um, places and buildings are important. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about why culture can be done in a park, but actually um, people need buildings to operate and people need spaces. And, you know, that's just a list of organisations. One of the first things we did was give a, a kind of rent relief for tenants occupying our buildings, some of which are very small, some of which are big, you know, so, you know, you've got Young Vic there, which is obviously kind of big, big hitter. Photo Fusion is kind of small gallery space and photography institute down in Brixton. And, and there's, there's a whole bunch of others um, because that's how people need places in order to get together. If you go to the next one, Toby. Um, uh, obviously, some of this requires cash, um, so we put together a, a hardship fund um, for the arts and culture sector, um, so grants between 10 and 25k um, total funds, and again, these are small organisations, and obviously at the moment, very pr presciently, that um, especially in a borough like Lambeth, black and, uh, in particular black, but black and Asian minority ethnic organisations are particularly being hit hard, um, and have always needed more support. Uh, to overcome the kind of institutional and structural racism that exists. Um, so we've been trying to make sure that supporting buildings and then supporting with cash to make sure that people don't go under and that they can carry on doing the work that they can do and that they survive so that we've got a rich cultural sector going forward. Um, if you do the next one. Um, part of our support for businesses um, put together 4.2 million for uh, economic hardship fund. Um, which is around supporting pubs and clubs and music venues and places where people get together. That's um, uh, Royal Vauxhall Tavern in my ward, which, you know, for anyone who's not been there, um, when it reopens, please go, go back. Um, and I think organisations like the Royal Vauxhall Tavern or Fire Night Club in Vauxhall have done this for a long time. They've changed their spaces to do different things. So Fire Night Club in Vauxhall, does a rave to the grave with the over 65s every Tuesday, or it did, because they had loads of empty space um, whilst the youngsters were sleeping off their kind of 8am finish. You then get schools coming in to do dancing because they got space. So I think there's something about how do we use the spaces that we've got. And for us, it was about making sure that their businesses uh, functioned um, and how do we make sure that they survive going forward. And um, if you go to the last one, um, uh, 
our Elevate programme is specifically targeted at young black and minority ethnic uh, young people to get into the cultural programme. And we know that there's been kind of all sorts of barriers that pre have prevented them from doing that. Um, and working with organisations like the Young Vic, like the Old Vic, like the National, um, as well as organisations more locally close to home. This is set up by young people and driven by young people. And you know, there's a link there so we can send that round. Um, I just want to talk just quick just briefly about culture and how I see it and where it gets done. So me and my partner and our 10 year old are going round looking for, we're looking to move house. And I was talking around my area where I live in Vauxhall. Um, and it really just struck me, not, not in relation to this, but just thinking more broadly, trying to point out all the benefits of the area. Um, in Vauxhall Park, uh, uh, sorry, in Vauxhall Spring Gardens, you've got open air cinema. You've got loads of stuff, culture that happens at Vauxhall City Farm. You've got open air theatre in Bonington Square. Um, culture happens in all sorts of places. On the estate that I live on, just outside is this kind of green space which has got a little climbing wall for kids. Um, and every summer there's always a bunch of young black girls doing their dance routines. Now that is not a custom built space to do dancing. But it's a space that people use and I suppose the way that I think about this is how do we curate places and um, when we developed that space with metropolitan housing we didn't think this is a feeder for Despinera at the Young Vic because people just get on and do their own culture right and so I think what's been really interesting for me is how do we use our space how do we understand spaces and how they're used by different people for different things um, uh, you know, I've been uh, supporting my my ten year old and his friends to do TikTok videos, which are absolutely awful. Um, they're doing kind of keepy uppy skills and all the rest of it, and that's their kind of introduction to becoming the showman, like me, hopefully with any with any luck. And um, you know, and and but that's about them expressing themselves and having to think through things, and um, it's really powerful. That can be done anywhere. Um, so I suppose the, the challenge is how do we keep organisations that are nurturing people and how do we keep spaces and how do we repurpose them so that we can not see things through one lens of what we think culture should be and how it gets done. It's how, how does the wider area in which we live or buildings that we use facilitate how people want to express themselves in a much broader sense. So I think there's lots of lessons that we've got to learn. I think we've got to start looking at how does how do our places interact with each other. But most importantly this is all about people and it's about how how what is the way in which people consume and engage do they just want to watch something do they want to do something um, and of course there's a huge role around the economy and how do we get people into the cultural sector whether that's behind the camera in front of the camera script writing lighting you know all of the myriad of jobs and opportunities that are out there for people um, and that's going to be absolutely crucial to the recovery um, and it has to be uh, something that takes into account people's deprivation and the challenges and the barriers that they faced at this point in time um, and something that Lambeth Council has been uh, planning for quite a long time tackling inequality specifically for our black communities in Lambeth maybe our Bangladeshi communities over in Tower Hamlets or, or whatever and but that's that's a really big challenge for all of us and um, we're we're super connected and we've got to just make sure that we bear that in mind as we look forward to a recovery for the sector and for people. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Hopkins. That's, that's very passionate and articulate, um, uh, uh, articulately put. Um, so let's turn to to um, to that the the economic sector. Nick, um, you're chief executive at the the South Bank Employers Group. Um, uh, when we, when when Councillor Hopkins talks about recovery, I and mean, what what are the challenges South Bank is going to have to uh, overcome to return to pre-pandemic levels of engagement? What do, what does the new normal mean? now for audiences and performers and workers and businesses based in in that part of Lambeth yeah so I've, I've got a few slides just to answer some of those points Toby but sure. I think I'd like to say you know actually the first thing I did this morning uh, a couple of hours before now was to actually thank Jack and his team at Lambeth for the support that they've given you know not just to the cultural sector but the wider economic sector through the hardship funds that they've worked very closely with the seven business improvement districts um, that operate in the borough. So South Bank Employers Group is a member organisation. We do many things in the area, one of which we actually run the South Bank Bid. We've, we've been in existence for 30 years and I'll come back to that narrative. But, but Lambeth um, and, and our, our neighbouring borough, so they've been really supportive, really proactive, and really understand what the business community in that wider sense needs. So it's been an absolute you know, partnership based approach. And so, you know, I'm I've been absolutely delighted to be able to say, you know, confirm this morning to sort of 17 
you know, operators in the sort of tourism and leisure sector this morning that, you know, through Lambeth's uh, endeavours, they've made, you know, a third of a million pounds available in grants to those organisations. And, and that's an absolute lifeline. That's a, that's a lifeline that enables uh, those businesses to move forward, to be able to then work with us as a beard and the council and partners around a coherent recovery plan. Um, so if I can just uh, answer uh, that in a bit more detail through... Um, um, do, do, do. Just bear with me. So hopefully that's uh, everyone can see that. So Southland Employers Group, um, we, we were Southland member organisation 30 years ago. Our purpose is that we're the champions of South Bank, protecting and enhancing this special place through creativity, collaboration and effective delivery. Um, the following slides then answer some of those points that sort of Toby has, has set. Um, so I think the first thing that you've asked is about the, the role that the cultural institutions play in that wider kind of sense of the local economy, how they generate jobs, their role in wider regeneration. And of course, the South Bank is, you know, it's, it, it's the place where this, this whole agenda really started, you know, from the 1951 Festival of Britain. Um, in a 2017 report that the GLA, Arts Council England and King's College uh, London produced, um, which showcased the ways in which culture and creativity, you know, impact on, on the economy and wider society. You know, I, I'm quoted in that report as saying, that, you know, culture and creativity led the South Bank to regeneration relations, and there, there's no better illustration of how that investment, you know, leads to a wider set of benefits around economic success and indeed uh, social benefits. And that, that, was, that sort of mix was fundamental to how the South Bank uh, grew from the mid-90s onwards, how the cultural bodies, you know, really led uh, a lot of the regeneration activity, how that then fostered, you know, wider economic growth. And what we've got now, you know, right up to pre-COVID, is a very diverse economic base, you know, six or seven economic sectors that were powering ahead, you know, it's absolute economic powerhouse as well as a cultural powerhouse as a neighbourhood. And I think that's, it's, it's about the role that those cultural institutions have played. Um, they are, of course, international leaders in their art form. They're commercially savvy. You know, these are organisations that have to excel across a range of disciplines. You know, the art form, the commercial way in which they manage their, their, their operations, um, their, their estate, you know, some of those organisations, South Bank Centre, National Theatre, BFI, you know, these are, these are big holders of, of kind of property and assets. And I'll come back to that point. And of course, they are leaders and pioneers in many ways about diversity, inclusion and equality. Um, they are all deeply ingrained in the local community in which they work, both in terms of like connections with residents, um, their wider connections with businesses and employees and, and business in the area. So it's a real skill base that the uh, cultural bodies have. And that's testament to the, the South Bank's success over the last sort of, 30 years or so, and will no doubt be absolutely key um, to, to the future and recovery. Um, but those challenges are, are keenly felt, you know, so having, if you like, set the template and the blueprint for that relationship between culture, regeneration, place making, creation of a destination, you know, the area was already feeling strained in terms of what levels of investment are needed to maintain a vibrant uh, uh, place with cultural organisations that do have a lot of responsibilities for land management, asset ownership. You know, those in the audience, you know, will be familiar with the King's Cross model, et cetera. You know, East Bank, where you've got, you know, often single landowners, uh, often private sector landowners who will make those commercial investments. You know, in the South Bank, we have arts organisations, charities who have significant responsibilities for the place. And that obviously puts a big strain in terms of finance, in terms of how they can you know, direct their resource to art forms and provide, you know, free, uh, free um, art and culture for, for many of the audiences uh, that, that Jack referred to. Um, so pre-COVID, you know, we were already feeling that in terms of competition from other parts of London and short haul destinations, European city breaks, etc. Um, and so obviously we've got some big immediate challenges around what those business impacts are on those organisations, you know. How do you get South Bank to be a place that audiences want to return to? big, big agenda around what we call COVID stewardship, you know, being very clear that this is a place that understands health and safety, cleanliness, making sure that the public realm is maintained, making sure that those organisations are supported so that people's return to the South Bank is one that's safe, welcoming, attractive, and, you know, is really demonstrating that this is an area that cares about people, that wants to make that experience as positive as it can be, and obviously the organisations 
However, the cultural organisations have a huge role uh, in, in, in delivering to that. Um, just to wrap up on a couple of points about what does the new normal mean for audiences and performers. Um, I think we're obviously seeing, you know, the new normal around virtual and the online. And I've sort of put versus and, because I think we're not in an either or. We're going to be in a future where people will be experiencing things virtually, but they'll also want to experience the real and the, and the experiential. You know, that, that will be, I think, the mix that we, we have to play with going forward. So audiences and their behaviour will change. Um, you know, what we have to do is we have to ensure that people want to engage and experience culture. Given what this pandemic has presented, which is, you know, a whole series of new precious demands and the choices that they make. I mean, John makes this point very, very eloquently, which going to the theatre fundamentally, you know, it's a, um, it's a uh, choice, you know, it's an option. People have a lot of options in life um, and ensuring that they make that positive choice of that experience and culture and place that itself like, is something that's got to be as attractive uh, as we can make it. And I think the virtual have to the virtual has to be more profitable. You know, if, if real audiences are if, if sorry, if the real audiences are experiencing things, you know, in, in, in reality on the South Bank are gonna to have to be socially distant. So, you know, we, we have that, that slide about NT Live, we've got the, the BFI player, you know, how, how these cultural organizations ramp up their commercial activity around the virtual is gonna be key to their long term survival as well. So finally, the areas of design that will be affected by the way culture is consuming the future, a place like South Bank, it, it's big, big priorities, the quality of the place, you know, so you've got to recognise that people will want to be in an attractive, exciting environment. So investment in the public realm, making sure that places are accessible, a big focus on, it, on inclusivity, being seen to be welcoming, being seen to be inclusive and absolutely delivering to that in all aspects of how the area, the neighbourhood works. And of course, the very practical impacts around health and place management. So what does that overall place experience look like? How does that work with the audiences, both you know, in the immediate you know, recovery stage, but also in the future? So big investment in the, this, this notion of COVID stewardship, you know, the management and the safety aspects. But I think going back to Jack's point, you know, a definite focus on how um, uh, ex externally a place feels in terms of curation. What's that program of events? What's that experience going to be like? And fundamentally, what do you want culture to achieve in terms of engagement, participation? Uh, and going back to your, your quote at the start, Toby, you know, being a fundamental part of what it is to be alive. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. That's, that's excellent stuff. And, and, and I think you, one of the sort of interesting for me as a wordsmith um, parts of your presentation there is the difficulty we now have in in discriminating between the online and the real I, i'm not sure uh, i'm not sure that that online isn't real anymore i mean my entire life is online at the moment so there's some there's some really fundamental changes to the way we kind of consume culture going on um yeah. and let's 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 start exploring some of that um let's talk to john langley uh, head head of external relations at the national theater john arts groups have moved online to promote existing shows and engage with the public how popular has that been and, and is it a viable delivery model during pandemic and have performers been been how have they been working during during lockdown where, where do you see that going well i think as you say it's a viable uh, form of activity during a pandemic I think the nature of theatre has always been, for, you know, 400 years in this country, to have a bunch of people in the audience, a bunch of people next to them on stage, and somewhere in the back of the auditorium there will always be a bar. And um, that, that has been the essential architecture of theatre all that time. The, the, the experience of live theatre is one that cannot be replicated, I believe, on film. Even though NT Live is filmed live, it goes out um, on demand or it goes out on the night, but it doesn't fully capture the experience of being in a room. The thing about theatre is about suspension of disbelief. You go into a theatre, you watch a bunch of people on stage, many of them you will recognise because you've seen them on TV or you've seen them in an advert or whatever, but within 10 minutes they have become somebody else. And if the play is really, really good, that is what carries you through the evening. Now, I, I see a lot of theatre because I, you know, I may, I'm very close to it, but I haven't actually seen a lot of NT Live. I've been watching some during the current uh, lockdown. NT Live was intended as a way of, first, firstly, of fully 
um, fulfilling the National Theatre's remit of being a national organisation. We could not, uh, with existing technology, go on pretending that you have to come to the South Bank to see the National Theatre. So we started this uh, back in 2009 as a way of getting to the national audience. Um, we also made it available in the first uh, instance in Europe. I was, um, I was sitting in my office um, uh, on the top floor of the National Theatre when the first um, anti-live broadcast went out. And I had an open line um, um, to uh, our feedback line, which we'd, which we'd recently introduced. And um, I could hear the, uh, I had also had a feed from the theatre, so I could hear the show going on. And um, it was quite extraordinary. The moment the show came down, and what was that there, were, there, were, there was a sort of 15 minute break, but the first emails came from Sweden for some reason. I have no, I have no idea. Presumably, maybe they were on a different uh, time scale at the time. But we suddenly started getting emails from Malmo about a theatre in Malmo that had been showing NT Live. And I think the next day we all thought this is this is quite extraordinary that we can that we can take this um, this vehicle all over the world. And that's the way that it has developed. But it is still kind of aid memoir. This is what you see when you come into the theatre and um, it, but it's not what you experience at home and um, I think there's there's been a couple of instances, it's been quite interesting for me to watch NT Life on, in the current manifestation. First of all, um, One Man Two Governors, which is by far the funniest show I've ever seen on stage, um, has a really clunky beginning because it's like a it's like a farce you've got it is a farce you've got to you've got to set up the audience so they know all the intricacies of the relationships that are going to develop so the first 15 minutes was 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 agonizing because it was you know it was so it was so clunky and you didn't have that experience of being close to the um uh close to the uh, performers but um as it went on it became screamingly funny as per usual but Anthony Cleopatra, on the other hand, which was a play I remember, production I remember, as being praised for its intimacy, an intimate uh, Anthony and Cleopatra on, on a big stage. Um, it just didn't feel quite the same if you'd seen it before. Now, there are a number of direct directors are not going to sit still through the pandemic. Um, they are inventive, creative, uh, it, it, you know, brilliant people. And they will be looking at all sorts of things. One of the things we're looking at is the Olivier Theatre, which, while it is a big open space theatre, is also an enormous, um, there is an enormous volume there. Um, most of it you don't see, it's in the rear, rear and side stages. So we're looking at opening up the Olivier Theatre in a different way. But I don't think this is really, I don't think ultimately this is a solution for theatre. You can, you know, you can socially distance an audience, but you can't socially distance a play. Sooner or later, there's got to be a fight, or there's got to be an embrace, or there's got to be some kind of re reconciliation. And if you're not putting across that full experience, I think it's, um, it needs to be, you know, reinterpreted in different ways. And I just wanted to talk briefly about one theatre that I'm also involved with, which is the Unicorn, um, uh, at London Bridge, somewhat further along the river. But um, it, it is a theatre purely for children from the age of six months. We do shows for babies um, and we go up to 18 and something around 18. And um, the artistic director, Justin Oderberg, has, has um, adapted one of his shows for, um, for the web. And it's, um, it's a show based on the Anansi stories, West African folk tales. And it was done in the theatre last November and he has completely reconceived it. It's not live and he, it's not a it's not an as live broadcast it has been completely reconceived for for the web and our next project there is um a show called i sinner which is about the unfortunate poet in julius caesar who got murdered by 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 mistake he was uh, uh he was mistaken for another sinner uh and it is um done as a one-man show by tim crouch brilliant man and um he is going to reinterpret it for zoom presentation so that the children who will be watching it will be on screen and can ask him questions but there will be a narrative running through it exactly the same um, and uh, I'm glad to see the old Vic is now um, broadcasting live I wish um, 
wish the Bob Dylan estate would grant them rights to do um, uh, to do uh, um, the uh, show they did the, of his music, and um, they might like to take comfort from the fact that recently Bob Dylan said in the uh, New York Times that um, seeing Phil from the North Country, his own show, let us let us uh, let us uh, uh, remember, was one of the most moving experiences, and he cried at the end. So I, I just hope he will. He will see what benefit could be offered to the uh, to the old Vic in that sense. So there are lots right. of different things going on, but I think ultimately we've we've got to get back to uh, uh, a, a bunch of people on the stage and a bunch of people in the audience. Thanks, John, and, and I'll share I'll share your 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 wish there. Um, De Despina, um, uh, ha how how does that resonate with you with you at the young Vic, and and um, how how could the way performances are offered there? Uh, permanently change or, or are we going to are we going to see a return to, to tradition do you think well thank you for the for the question um, Toby it's funny because you, you asked me to reflect on how could uh, the way performances are offered be permanently changed but for some reason in my head I, I heard a slightly different provocation which is what will be lost what will emerge who will survive in our sector post pandemic and um, Kwame, our artistic director and CEO, recently said, we know that recessions and depressions make us smaller and not larger. We become our smaller selves. And the fear is that lockdown may contract us and not expand us. Um, and, and these comments were in the context of, of warning against the arts rolling back some of its progress in terms of diversity and representation. But in a way, for me, that's the answer to the overall question. It is absolutely crucial. We do not become risk averse in the aftermath of this disaster. And I think if the UK arts and culture scene is going to return its place as a progressive force for good and stay a societal success story as well as a commercial one. It has to remember that its work is as impactful and as valuable when it's being made for local residents and neighbours as when it's being exported worldwide. And so to survive, we need to re resist this retreat into commercially safe content. And that applies to the stories that are told, the tellers who tell them, and crucially, this, the form in which they speak to audiences. So everyone in the theatre sector is going to need to ensure that the opportunities to platform new artistic voices are not lost as the dust settles. Otherwise, we risk rolling backwards in terms of those who have access into the industry. We have to essentially assist on a future where we continue to make work by talent that doesn't know its talent yet, and we create canonical works that are not yet in the canon. In a way, I fear not for the sector's imagination looking forwards, especially in terms of new technology. The rich ecology of theatre makers that we already have has made powerful performances on IG Live, in VR, but also on moonlit beaches, solo plays in cars, secret libraries, immersive hide and seek video games. But when we think about advancement and progress and the future, in my mind, it can't just be about massive hardware. The future isn't just gonna be about which theatres have the sexiest XR lab or the best built-in VR equipment. Although John, we're very envious of the NT's uh, immersive storytelling studio. Um, but it will be, and it always has been about the, the radical impact of stories we choose to tell in terms of the formal innovations and who is privileged in consuming them. So in a way, we're looking out for the air to NT life, but we also have to stretch ourselves further to ensure we're using it to amplify the right message because when theatre is at its best, it's when form and content really combine. Um, when we um, co-produced with the National Theatre and the National Film Board of Canada a production called Draw Me Close at the Young Vic last year, it wasn't just that we were trialling for the first time in British public a new single person private sensory experience that used a combination of animation and VR and live performance. It was the fact that the complexity of form created a really extraordinary canvas for a memoir about a son's experience of cancer. And that combination of formats on each other created a really heightened sense of empathy and made a visceral experience and then the newness of the form for the audience member in turn created trepidation and vulnerability that really mirrored the experiences in the story when i worked at punch drunk the brilliant enrichment team there delivered a project called Green Hive Green with a charity called Magic Me and it constructed a fully sensory immersive village green in a care home in Peckham and for weeks the practitioners delivered workshops with elderly residents with dementia in this totally unique space. The COVID pandemic essentially has required us to confront our relationship with many parts of society and no more so than with the elderly. So I suggest that when we emerge the culture sector needs to really continue to advocate for support 
of innovative practice in societal settings like care homes, like schools, like hospitals. Um, last year and, and the year before, under Kwame's new leadership, we created a production called Young the Compact for the sole purpose of touring it to non-theatre spaces in Lambeth and Southwark, and it was free, obviously, to those communities that we went to. So we resourced a high-concept production and we performed it in a football academy on a wet Wednesday morning to young men who had never been to the theatre, as well as performances in a domestic violence refuge, in a homeless shelter, and to me, that is progress as much as the, the evolution of digital art forms. Uh, at Punch Drunk, we, we made a new production, again, um, through the enrichment um, arm of the charity called The Oracles, with the most immersive practice we could envisage. It was uh, Google's Creative Lab and a production company called Grumpy Sailor who blended digital and physical worlds to create magical moments of audience interaction. And it was the, the radical um, element of it was that it was designed for the toughest and most underserved audience in our, um, in our locale, which were primary school children from Haringey. It was a cross-platform experience that alternated episodes in a story that you played on iPads and then live theatrical experiences on site. So this is a moment, I think, post-pandemic and during the pandemic where we have to remember that the mission of subsidised theatre is fundamentally a charitable one as well as a futuristic one. So our radical resistance to the conservative momentum has to include audiences and consumers as well as the search for new forms. So yes, we want to have performance spaces in the future with the capability for extended VR animation, but maybe we have to challenge ourselves to use them for work with local SEN schools to support pupils creating non-verbal device performances. The beauty of new technologies are that they can be used to give voice to those who've not yet spoken or who are still unheard today. And so I hope that the, the future performance in our sector is that we grapple with difficult societal questions, as we always have done, they, that we reflect ourselves back to us for, for better or for worse. And we need to involve, I would say, the broadest range of, of professionals and non-professionals in, in doing that. Um, so my, my, my sort of vision of the future is that those new works of art contend with responsibilities of public culture and they go beyond just amplifying those who we've already heard from. When, when we were established 50 years ago, Frank Dunlop talked about a paperback theatre. The Young Vic would deliver high quality content accessible to all at inexpensive prices. And I, I want us to continue that mission today because we're very proud to be synonymous with inclusivity, accessibility and, and creativity. And, and this is a great conversation to be having because we're always looking for partners who, who understand that combined responsibility. Fantastic, Desmond. Thank you very much, and thank you to all, all, all our panel. I mean, uh, for anyone who, who's out there trying to trying to wonder, uh, wondering how, how to um, how, how to get performances um, to, to people uh, during during lockdown, during social distancing, we've got a cornucopia of, of ideas that have come out uh, for, from our panel this morning. It's brilliant, They're absolutely packed with with uh, concepts. Um, and interesting ideas. And also it segues uh, into one of the questions. You, you stirred up a, a, a hornet's nest of questions from, from the viewers. You've woken everyone up over breakfast. So brilliant job panel. Um, uh, one, one of the questions I, I, I fear may dominate the rest of the conversation actually, it's, it's, it's such a big one, is from Lee uh, Terrafranca, uh, who's watching um, and who has some issues with, with her own borough um, uh, uh, in, in terms of the, the likelihood of, of getting a, a theatre built, a concert hall built. Um, in, in the in the borough, um, and and Lee asks, how can local people override uh, councils in a fight for the arts, and, and perhaps more um, importantly, how can we get into national policy the need for arts and creativity for for better health and well being? And um, Councillor Hopkins, you know, what, what's your on this in, in this area? What's your ask from from government? You know, it, 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 uh, is, is there is there is there more that they could do that is realistically we can hope for? Um, and you're on mute, so if you just un unclick yeah, that. Yeah, you, you think I would have sorted that out by now. Um, uh, that is a really big question. I mean, I suppose, and there was also another question earlier from Emma Peters around what's the kind of local relationship. So um, I, I can't talk for Merton. And I know Stephen, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm surprised that he would have said something like that, but we'll, I'll, I'll leave that. Um, ours is about connectivity. And, you know, so whether that's around um, the outreach that kind of Despina and John and others do, how do you get young people especially excited about going to the theatre or understanding culture in different ways? How do you connect through to schools? How do you do that kind of local um, kind of connectivity piece? So young people who, you know, might live in Waterloo um, might never be able to afford a ticket 
think that it's a place for them and they get invited in to do something to go and see an art exhibition their schools are taking them there so i think there's something about how, how do we locally connect up because most people are local in their in their approach to things um in terms of government um there's something about curriculum here there's something about education that this isn't just an add-on you know the, the, the actually culture is quite fundamental for people's emotional well-being emotional development uh, expression um, and, and as Desmond has said you know the, the ways in which people are talking about political issues or issues that matter um, through culture are really really crucial you know we we've had challenges in our borough around um violence affecting young people and you know i've had conversations with people saying i didn't know where this knife crime th came from and you're like well sorry dizzy rascal won a mercury prize in about 2001 um you've just obviously not been listening to what people are telling you you know and that's not niche that's you know top of the pops so i think there's something about where's the recognition that arts isn't just this little add-on thing and it's not just about theater land that actually there's there's a concept there you know and and yeah you, you go back to 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 certain days so i think there's something there i think there's definitely something around how do we understand it not just as an economic driver as well but and uh, i think there's a ch there's a problem for the government looking at uh, employment figures and going well that's all right then um Obviously, they're not saying that at the moment, but it's also about how do we understand the social benefit um, and the broadening of horizons and the kind of uh, the opportunity that working in the cultural sector provides you um, rather than just pounds, pence and contributions to GDP. And I, I just don't think that gets done. So in Lambeth, we're taking an approach where we are looking um, rather than at economic growth as a driver. We're looking at people's well-being. Now, once you start looking at well-being as a measure of is our borough doing well and are our people doing well uh, culture plays a huge part in that you know whether that's going to the theatre whether that's making a TikTok, whether that's playing football or doing some sort of sport which is, is around engagement so i think the, the government needs to really really change how it's looking at uh, what is a successful country um, it, once they start doing that and if they started taking a well-being approach you know like your finland's like your kind of scandinavian countries then i think culture automatically rises up because it's obvious for everyone thank you thanks councillor john you wanted to come in on that yeah i just wanted to supplement some of the um points there um from the national theatre's point of view um the um uh, we've had a very good uh, relationship with the council for a number of years now, going back to um, the um, NT Future project um, back in 2004, which completed in 2014. Um, we took a lot of liberties with a listed building in which we were supported by uh, by the local council and some of the uh, some of the listing experts. Um, and one of the things we created in the old pro um, prop store element of the uh, building was a learning centre, which is open from 10 o'clock in the morning until five o'clock at night, five days a week, and it is always full of children. It's next to the Dorfman. Um, and um, if, if rehearsals and um, breaks allow, children can be taken into the Dorfman, which is a fully adaptable, uh, movable stage and, and do some uh, scenes that they've just been working on. So they get a, you know, they get um, curated sort of sense of what theatre is and then the actual direct experience of it. Ironically, we're now working with the council um, very hard to preserve the, um, the learning centre because we have some major building works going on um, next door. But it is it is a relationship which which allows that kind of um, um, interchange of, um, of of concerns about the way that um, you know theatre like the National exists in a vibrant and incredibly active development area. Um, the other thing I was just going to say, which I which I didn't mention before, is that NT Live goes into schools on demand. It's, uh, it's not the full programme, but it is um, shows either related to the curriculum or shows that teachers have asked to see. And that's, that's a free service going to schools throughout the, throughout the country, which is you know, another example of what we're, what we're trying to do uh, to, to underline our, our national status, if you like. Great stuff. Thanks a lot, John. And, and, and just returning to, to the original question, um, which was uh, regarding uh, the, the efforts of local people to, to get a concert hall built uh, in, in Merton. Um, we, we've, we've got a very close relationship with Merton and, and have interviewed uh, the, the leader there on, on the Voice of Authority before, and we'll certainly give them a, a right to reply uh, on, on that um, later this week. Um, uh, but De Despina, um, one of the questions coming from, from the audience is around um, the interaction between um, the arts institutions and schools in particular and, and whether or not 
um, arts buildings and spaces can be used uh, in, in work with schools to engage children in arts and culture, but also to help develop confidence in safe education? Well, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant question because, of course, you know, large swathes of the arts and culture sector has been lobbying for um, arts uh, subjects to be back on the civil arts and a, a, kind of, um, a kind of resistance to arts education being depleted in the way that it has been over the last few years. So we're very interested, actually, at seeing whether we can use our, our building for, as, as a teaching environment. And I, I had um, learning actually emailed us, about that, <laughs> emailed us about that just the other day. Um, I mean, I think in a way, our public building could be used for any manner of local uses. And I think we're really interested to think about way of making it useful in the time of pandemic. I mean, at the moment, we're redeploying all kinds of things in our organisation. We have a lot of people on furlough, but, you know, some of our team are volunteering to deliver hot meals to um, uh, uh, residents in Southwark uh, through Blackfriars Settlement Charity. So we are really interested in, in innovation at this time in terms of our purpose, in terms of our physical space. So I, I would encourage people to get in touch with us and, and, to, uh, and to think about how we can be purposeful and useful at this time. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we've got members of the audience are, are, are doing a, a, a special Zoom thing, which is raising their hand through through the app. And I'm afraid I'm I'm being very autocratic in uh, in this presentation, and um, we're, we're restricting the the viewing time to to our panel. Um, but do feel free to engage with our panel through the Q and A and the and the uh, and the chat functions. Um, and speaking of the chat function, uh, Reese Thomas is asking uh, about whether or not there's a concern with the development of all the alternative content and changing platforms of delivery, the public perception of the value, role and function of theatre and arts buildings themselves is going to be diminished. Um, and uh, um, Nick, I think you said that you had a, a view on that. And, and you're on, just to let you know, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, I, I had a view on the other point around Merton, but I guess, I guess it's not, it's not just... There's, Feel there's, free there's, to pick up on any, any, yeah, any well, of the strands. Yeah. I, I know Stephen as well, but let's, uh, yeah, as you said, Toby, you can pick that up. But um, no, I think, I think in answer to that question, the the art arts buildings obviously play a hugely diverse role, you know, and I think in some ways it's wrong, you know, just to think of them as arts buildings. I mean, all, all of the cultural organisations, you know, on the South Bank of Waterloo, you know, demonstrate that these are places that aren't just engines of kind of cultural activity and cultural enlightenment. They're also places that generate huge economic uh, uh, value, not just in themselves, but crucially what they then spin off and what they anchor in terms of other economic activity you know culture is synonymous with tourism hospitality um, those sectors are then themselves increasingly uh, hugely relevant to what businesses want around them what businesses want for their employees and I think this is a really important dynamic to recognize the changing pattern of work and the changing pattern of you know employers and what they will inevitably be uh, morphing into in allowing more remote working, home-based working, etc. You're beginning to see, you know, places like the city recognise that investing in cultural activity and cultural outputs, so look at Culture Mile, etc., is fundamental to the future. I, I don't, you know, I actually see that the, f the future of place is about actually ensuring that those employees that are going to be working you know, in a place, whether it's, you know, two days a week, whether it's going to be on different patterns, having a couple of vibrant, you know, places is going to be fundamental to why you didn't bother. You know, if you've got the choice of working remotely, you know, you've got to make that, that place to work as exciting, as engaging, as rewarding, as enriching as possible. I, I think the other thing, though, that often gets overlooked is just how important, you know, we've heard this from the, panel, the, the panels, but just how those organisations are fundamental to, to everyday life, you know, whether that's friends meeting up, whether that's community groups, you know, using some of the facilities these arts organisations have. So I think everyone, you know, every arts organisation that certainly I'm aware of in the South Africa have, have, have purposely, you know, moved towards, an, I want to say an operating model, you know, from a business perspective, but very much to the core of their purpose. How do you make these places, you know, centres of, education, learning, socialization, fun, you know, and, and inclusivity, that the, these are the drivers that, you know, the, the organizations on staff have also demonstrated, which we're seeing, you know, with, with other places as well. And I think that these are the dynamics that will be ever more important for the future. Well, inclusivity is a, 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 a really important point in, in, in all of this. I mean, you've, you've, you've all raised it. Um, and, and Robert Purton in, in the audience asks it, in, 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 
the same question, but in a, in a slightly different way, which is um, that that um, the arts will survive in in London because London's got this huge sort of um, uh, the huge numbers that can can support it. But what are the prospects? Uh, for culture, for the majority of the population who live outside the M25. And I, we, we're going to be um, dealing with a number of these threads over the next month. We've got, we've got four sessions on, on the role of culture in, in, in placemaking uh, coming up. And, and we'll be looking at some of the developments um, out, out, outside London in later sessions. But I wonder, um, Councillor Hopkins, uh, um, you, you've, you, you are now, Lambeth is an established part of, of central London, of, of inner London, but do, do you have any sympathies for, for the sort of smaller, more regional um, uh, um, uh, institutions that, that are going to struggle to survive through this? Um, yes, I suppose I do. Uh, I suppose, but my kind of remit is my borough and um, I suppose, you know, I, I, I I've always lived in London, apart from a little little time in New York City. But apart from that, I've always been a Londoner. So my knowledge of outside London is scarily shocking, actually. And uh, colleagues from the local government association tease me regularly. Um, I, I I suppose my my remit and my role as leader of Lambeth Council is to make sure that uh, every young person and every person in Lambeth gets access to this and gets to express themselves. And I think when you look at the stats around kind of um, inclusion and diversity in the arts sector, when you look at stuff around um, child poverty, when you look at the kind of challenges that we've got in, in my borough, I don't think it's done. Um, I think there's more for us to do. Um, and, you know, we've got such a, a kind of uh, huge anchor institutions up in the South Bank. For me, it's about how do we then spread that through the rest of the borough? You know, there are young people in Brixton who've never been to Waterloo. They wouldn't go there. And there's some young people who can't go to Waterloo because they can't go through certain patches. So, you know, you've got Streatham Space, which is a theatre down in Streatham, which has opened up. And I think it's the only place I've ever seen where the entire billing um, uh, was all black acts. I don't think I've ever seen that before. And I'm talking comedy, music, all sorts of other stuff, you know. And and uh, we're, we're helping Oval House Theatre move to Brixton so that there's a cultural institution. So for me, it's about how do we, how do we make sure that kind of spaces for culture um, can be localised and, you know, spread right across the borough, whether that's Omnibus in Clapham or whatever else. And then how do we make sure that they are open and inclusive and that we're making sure that people are able to get in there and feel that it's a place for them rather than you know or you know that's that's a theater crowd that's a white middle class people i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do it and so i think i i i you know if i ever get to be prime minister i'm sure i'll care about the the regions a little bit more but right now uh, i'm worried about lambeth and the people in lambeth and how do we make sure that culture is as accessible and, and accessible as possible it was a clumsily asked question, uh, Councillor, and you answered it brilliantly. It, it was really about the cultural, the, the powerhouse of the, the sort of inner part of Lambeth um, up, up against the river there um, and how that how that benefits the, the more peripheral parts well, of the borough. Well, you I, well, it I absolutely think, perfectly. Well, I, and, I, and I think, and actually, I, 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 I know I've mentioned it before, but the work that is done by the Old Vic and the Young Vic and the National and other institutions up there are really important. And so we have a, <clears throat> pardon me, a cultural partnership with all of those organizations but then also lots of smaller organizations and you know youth organizations with a cultural focus and you know it's not a here's the south bank and then here's here's other bits of culture that are a little bit more smaller or more diverse and um, it's it's a cultural network isn't it you know and yeah, yeah. so so the young ladies you know the young girls who are kind of practicing their dance moves in the park across from my estate you know how do we make sure that you know one day that if they want to go and do that that they're getting the opportunity to go up to ballet rombe in waterloo and uh, and say wow this is amazing this is you know just like what we're what we're doing how do we make sure that we're giving them that opportunity and that stage in a in a literal sense to learn and to explore so i, I think yeah. it, 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 it it's a it's a network and it's an ecosystem that we've got to grow and and i think i'm very lucky having you know the cultural bit of the south bank unlike southwark who you know they're a bit more businessy Okay, let, let's not go. Let's not go there. Into into borough rivalry. Des, Despina, you wanted you wanted to pick up on that. Yeah, I wanted to pick up on that because I think that's um, really well um, put, Councillor. And I think it speaks to one of the other questions that we've had on the thread, which is around um, you know community comfort in public spaces, which I I think is really important to address because we're custodians of these public buildings, and actually it is absolutely incumbent on us to try and break down barriers all the time we've got 
plenty of work to do to, to kind of move forward and move further into making buildings feel like they belong to everyone from, you know, the recruitment of our front of house team to, um, the stories that we tell on our stages to the marketing that we have on the external parts of our building to where our security guard stands and and how they interact with people in a way the answer to the question which is what do cultural institutions do what can what can we do to to make more people feel comfortable in these spaces that can seem privileged and can feel exclusive and, and can sometimes um seem like they uphold systemic racism and, and discrimination I just think that work is we we can never do enough to break down those barriers and it's going to have to be our youth engagement strategy it's going to have to be our recruitment policy it's going to be you know our leadership strategy for the sector who are the role models what stories are we telling what playwrights are we commissioning and how do we then express that through our kind of public communication materials it's 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 a big job and it's uh, and I think it's really right to raise the responsibility as it sits upon us and that extends to the democracy of the architecture of the buildings and how excluding that can feel if you've never been told that that is a, a place in which you're welcome and I guess that's partly why I reference some of the work we do in getting out of the four walls of our building because I think in a way our responsibility is to go to people and tell them that they are, are welcome and not have an expectation that they will just find their way, way in and come to us somehow yeah yeah, thank you, Desmond. Um, John, would you like to pick up this? And, and, and also, you know, we've got, we've got an audience here of, of, of placemakers. Um, so, so what is it that, that, that an arts institution such as the National can do um, for, for placemakers? How, how can you interact with people when, you, when, um, when they're shaping uh, the, 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 the places that, that we live in? And, and what's the role of your institution beyond its own immediate sort of boundaries? Are, are, you, are you reaching out? Well, um, I, when I talked about the learning the learning center earlier, that has nothing to do with our day to day um, activities on stage. That is an entirely um, disinterested um, education space for theatre skills, um, life skills, speaking skills, um, and so so on. And that is busy throughout the day. But we do have. I mean, we're very lucky to have a democratic architecture around the South Bank that kept, started with the um, uh, started with the um, festival, festival of Britain. But Lasden's um, intention with the National Theatre was to make it a democratic space. And I think for several years, nobody really got that, even though he had said there will, uh, there will come a time with the National Theatre when the life of the city washes up against the walls and into the foyers throughout the day. And the insistence that he made was, um, which was agreed with by First Director Peter Hall was that the building would be open from 10 o'clock in the morning for anybody to come in. Um, and now we are um, pretty much full throughout the day with kids who come in. And uh, we've got um, nothing at the moment, of course, but we've got groups practicing dance moves. We, we're all pretty au fait with the, uh, with the schedule of dance competitions in London because they build up and uh, they're on the terrace. and. And, um, and, and then they disappear for a while. So the life of the city has come to the National Theatre and we don't in any way curate that. We don't in any way restrict it. People come into the building when they want. Uh, we get play readings and uh, line runs of, um, you know, older, older Amdram teams. And I think that is the part of the public side of things that you see, but also we have a vast number of people working on interrelationships with schools throughout the country not just through NT Live but through um, um, through other activities and we're also we've also been doing for the last we've done two productions of community plays where we take people and immerse themselves in a community I think we're in Aldershot somewhere uh, I think that that was this year's project so we go out to meet the um, people who are interested in putting on the shows we then bring them into the national um, they work in the rehearsal room for a week or so um, on different skills and then we go back and um, and um, meet them in, in in situ and eventually that play will come to the national theater for a performance on the on the olivier stage Thank you. so i think a lot of this is covered. I'm sure there are other things going on. It's, it's a big building that I don't, you know, that I don't even know about. But it is a fully active building, using every part of its, uh, every part of its um, estate. And the, the one thing I just emphasise that, as Nick said, 
that South Bank is almost entirely run by charities, including on that image yeah. you showed, the uh, the gardens in the front are fragile. You know, the buildings are resilient and strong, but the economy is fragile. And that applies to Jubilee Gardens um, and, and really the whole of the Queen's Walk. I think, John, John, that's a very appropriate note to, to, to end on, the, the fragility of, of, of the amazing institutions and, and, and performances and performance spaces that have been created. And, and we'll be teasing out some of those threads and, and uh, analysing them in, in, in more detail over, over the coming weeks. Um, but in the meantime, we, we've got a whole bunch of questions unanswered from, from our audience. Uh, apologies for not getting to those, but I am going to put those questions to our panel and hope that they can find some time over the next uh, few hours and days to answer those by email and we'll relay their responses by social media so you will be heard. Um, but for now, uh, what a fantastic contribution uh, live from, from you all, uh, panel. Thank you very much indeed for giving us so much uh, food for thought. Thank you for sparing so much time uh, at such a, a busy and, and, and frantic uh, time for, for everyone. Uh, please uh, graciously accept the, the virtual applause that's rippling out over breakfast tables across the land. Thank you, Nick Durston, Councillor Jack Hopkins, John Langley and Deskema Satsas. Thank you so much. And thank you to you Excellent. out there our brilliant uh, breakfast audience. Um, we're going to pick up some of these threads uh, next Tuesday at 8.30 again, when we're asking how and why councils, artists and the development community are supporting each other uh, post coronavirus. And, and we'll be looking uh, uh, more geographically sort of um, uh, varied uh, case studies of, of how that's happening. Uh, we'll be supported again by our excellent partners, you and I, and Inner Circle Consulting. Uh, and before that, on Thursday at 11, we're working with another terrific outfit in Montague Evans, asking how councils can help make development healthy. You can book your places for those sessions and watch a recording or read a report from this and all of our previous sessions at thevoiceofauthority.co.uk. And now um, we're going to play out with a uh, special clip that's been provided by the Young Vic to remind us uh, of what we've missed during lockdown uh, in the last month. Uh, and I hope um, to, to give us a taste of uh, how important uh, for us all in our well-being uh, these things are, and perhaps to ease you into the rest of your working day. So bear with me while I share our screens. What's the matter, honey? You lost? They told me to take a street call named Desire and then transfer to one called Cemeteries and ride a six blocks and get off at Elysian Fields. That's where you are now. At Elysian Fields? This here is Elysian Fields. Well, they mustn't understood what number I wanted. What number you looking for? 632. Well, you don't need to look no further. I'm looking for my sister, Stella Dubois. I mean, Mrs. Stanley Kowalski. <laughs> That's the party. <laughs> you did just miss her, though. This? Can this be her home? She got the downstairs here, and I got the up. Oh, and she's out? You notice that bowling alley around the corner? I'm not sure I did. Well, that's where she's at, watching her husband bowl. You want to leave your suitcase, go find her? No. I'm going to tell her you come. Thanks. You're welcome. She wasn't expecting you. No, no, not tonight. Well, why don't you just go inside and make yourself at home till they get back? Oh, how could I do that? Oh, we own this place so I could let you in. Um, thank you very much indeed again to our panel. Thank you very much again uh, to our audience. Uh, and all that remains to say is good morning from them, good morning from me, and good morning from everyone at Three Fox. Good morning.